Manhood Part 1 Boyhood is one of the happiest periods of life. Ye little know, said Robert Burns, the ill ye caught when manhood is your wish. Taking a look backward Lord Byron cried, Ah, happy years once more, who would not be a boy? Thomas More says, in his beautiful poem, Oft in the Stilly Night. The smiles, the tears of boyhood's years. The words of love then spoken. The eyes that shone now dimmed and gone. The cheerful hearts now broken. Thus in the stilly night. Ere slumber's chain has bound me. Sad memory brings the light. Of other days around me. There is no boy so poor, said Phillips Brooks, so ignorant, so outcast, that I do not stand in awe before him. I feel a profounder reverence for a boy than a man, said President Garfield. I never meet a ragged boy on the street without feeling that I owe him a salute for I know not what possibilities may be buttoned up under his coat. Why, bless me, is that the boy who did so gallantly in those two battles, asked President Lincoln as a lad from the gunboat Ottawa was introduced to him. Why, I feel as though I should take off my hat to him, and not he to me. Get out of my way. What are you good for anyhow? Asked a cross man to a lad who happened to be standing in his way. The boy replied, They make men out of such things as I am. How true. That dirty boy taken by a philanthropist in New Orleans, only for the reason that he was an orphan became Sir Henry M. Stanley, who found Livingston and opened Africa. About 50 years ago, when New York City sought to aid her homeless children, an agent called on Judge John Green, of Tixton, Indiana, to inquire if he would take a boy. Mr. Green said, I will, if you will bring me the raggedest, dirtiest and ugliest one of the lot. A boy by the name of John Brady more than filled the bill. He was accepted, educated, and became a missionary to Alaska. So suitable a man was he for commissioner of that unexplored land of wealth, that President Harrison appointed him governor. Who can value the worth of a boy? Like Moses, Luther, or Lincoln, he might rise to bless a nation. Boyhood is the blossom that ripens into manhood. It is the formative period of one's character. Said Lord Collingwood to a young friend, you must establish a character before you are twenty-five that will serve you all life. The building of such is the greatest earthly task and he is the greatest man who chooses right with the most invincible resolution, who resists the sorest temptation from within and without, who is most fearless under menaces and frowns, whose reliance on truth, on virtue, and on God, is most unfaltering. To aid in the growth of such is this work written. It is hoped that it will be transformed into an epitome, a registry of the reader's own life, a compilation and condensation of the best things he shall finally leave to those who survive him. For it should, to one of these four ends conduce, for wisdom, piety, delight or use. Incorporated herein are the best things of many books, the thoughts of noble men which by the power of a just appreciation and of a retentive memory may be made one's own. 
Of those who have written introductions to this work, some have since retired from their official positions, and some are dead. The stories gathered from many sources illustrate great principles, which, if carefully heeded will conduce to a happy and manly life, for he most lives, who thinks most, feels the noblest, acts the best. You can make yourself look an inch taller by neat, well-fitting dress. You can actually make yourself taller by an erect, manly carriage. Slovenliness is contagious. It communicates itself from the dress to the character. The boy who slouches and slumps in figure and gait is dangerously apt to slump morally. The dust and grime on your clothes is liable to get into your brain. The dirt under your fingernails is likely to work into your thoughts. Grease spots down the front of your coat will destroy self-respect almost as quickly as a habit of lying. Tidiness is one of the cheapest luxuries in the world. It is also one of the most comfortable. When you know, when you are dead sure that you are just right, perfectly correct, from hat to shoe tie, the King of England couldn't stare you out of countenance, he couldn't embarrass you, and, he wouldn't if he could. A high column was to be built. The workmen were engaged, and all went to work with a will. In laying a corner, one brick was set a trifle out of line. This was unnoticed, and as each course of bricks was kept in line with those already laid, the tower was not built exactly erect. After being carried up about 50 feet, there was a tremendous crash. The building had fallen, burying the men in the ruins. All the previous work was now lost, the material wasted, and several valuable lives sacrificed, all through the misplacement of one brick at the start. The workman at fault little thought what mischief he was making for the future. It is so with the boy building character. He must be careful in laying the foundation. Just so far as he governs, guards and trains himself, just so far will he succeed or fail in the estimation of others. Tennyson wisely wrote, Self-reverence, self-knowledge, self-control, these three alone lead life to sovereign power. Never in the history of any people did boys have so much in their favor to assist them in reaching the pinnacle of success as American boys. Back of them is an ancestry of the best blood of the leading nations of the world, an ancestry noted for persistence, reverence, piety, and patriotism. The educational institutions of the land have turned out thousands of young men who have beaten their pathway upward in spite of adverse circumstances, all of which seems to say to the boy today, there's room at the top in whatever profession you may follow. A good beginning is the most necessary thing, for it is half the battle. In any race a man can well afford to miss applause at the starting line, if he gets it at the goal. A slow but determined start is not incompatible with a swift conclusion. Experienced mountain climbers seem almost lazy, so calmly do they put one foot in front of the other, but they stand well breathed on the summit, while their comrades are panting at the halfway station. One must not swerve to the right or left, but, setting his face toward duty, like Marcus Curtius who rode to death in the Roman Forum, he must push forward, 
with an honest ambition to reach the goal of success. It is not always the boy of aristocratic birth, wealthy parentage or social standing that wins the world's laurels, but usually those boys who are unfortunately situated, who hew their way in the world instead of having it laid out and smoothed for them. One of our presidents, when asked what was his coat of arms, remembering that he had been a chopper of wood in his youth, replied, a pair of shirt sleeves. Lord Tenterden was proud to point out to his son the shop in which his father had shaved for a penny. A French doctor once taunted Fleshier, Bishop of Nîmes, who had been a tallow chandler in his youth, with the meanness of his origin, to which Fleshier replied, If you had been born in the same condition that I was, you would still have been a maker of candles. Where is the boy with nobility of soul and purpose, who, though poor, is not tidy, who, being of humble origin, is not industrious, who, ridiculed by others, is not kind, and who, cramped by circumstances, is not heroic. That boy will rise to honor and fill an important place in life. He, like other boys of this country, may be a star rather than a flashing meteor in the realm of society. From a farm to the presidential chair seems a long distance, but Abraham Lincoln traveled it, and left behind him a name and reputation never to die. Andrew Johnson began life as a tailor and subsequently rose to be the chief officer of the nation. George Peabody was an apprentice in a country store, and ended as a millionaire philanthropist. Cyrus W. Field was in early life a clerk, but the world is indebted to him for the successful completion of the Atlantic Cable. Samuel F. B. Morse, from an artist, became the inventor of the electric telegraph. Charles Dickens, the great novelist, began life as a newspaper reporter. Levi P. Morton was a clerk, John Wanamaker a messenger boy, Lyman J. Gage a night watchman and James Whitcomb Riley a wandering sign painter. The record, instead of being in the tens, could be increased to thousands of statesmen, governors, generals, business and professional men who have risen from the farm, the shop, the store, to important offices within the nation's gift. There is no reason why a boy cannot make his way in the world. He may not be president, or banker, or lawyer, but he can fill an honorable position. He may be a master mechanic, a model businessman, a useful educator, if he is willing to begin at the lowest round in the ladder, namely, neatness. Boys are men of a smaller growth, and if they fail to cultivate self-respect, it means the blighting of manhood, the ostracism of society, and the closing of the gate of opportunities to success. Self-respect is a robe with which every boy should clothe himself. It lies at the root of all virtues. It begets a stability of character, is the sentinel of the soul as the eyelid of the eye, and the cornerstone of all virtues. There is no need in this day and country for a boy to go around with dirty face and hands. It is injurious to health, unbecoming and repulsive to any self-respecting person. On the other hand from the body's purity, the mind receives a secret, sympathetic aid. When Isaac Hopper, the Quaker, met a boy with dirty face or hands, he would stop him and inquire if he ever studied chemistry. The boy, with a wondering stare, would answer, No well then, I will teach thee how to perform a curious chemical experiment. Go home, take a piece of soap, put it in water, and rub briskly on thy hands and face. Thou hast no idea what a beautiful froth it will make, and how much whiter thy skin will be. That's a chemical experiment, I advise thee to try it. There is great virtue in soap and water vigorously applied, which doubtless gave rise to the old adage, cleanliness is next to godliness, for virtue never dwells long with filth. An eminent man said, I believe there never was a person scrupulously attentive to cleanliness who was a consummate villain. 
The singing birds are remarkable for the neatness and cleanliness of their plumage. The gay and cheerful animals of the fields avoid filth and are usually of a clean appearance. The beauty and fragrance of the flowers owe all to this characteristic, and so also does the boy who is bright, intelligent, moral and ambitious. You will not find his fingernails long, but carefully trimmed and devoid of dirt, his ears and neck will be spotless, and his teeth clean and white like drops of snow in banks of pretty pink roses. Self-respect will also show itself in neatness of dress. It has, says Barrington, a moral effect upon the conduct of mankind. Let any gentleman find himself with dirty boots, soiled neckcloth, and a general negligence of dress, he will, in all probability, find a corresponding disposition by negligence of address. To be tidy does not mean to have costly attire. It is no mark of neatness for a boy to deck his fingers with rings, to sport a gold-headed cane, to wear flashy neckwear, to have a bouquet of flowers on the lapel of his coat, for while these are not unbecoming in themselves, they give the impression of that sin which overthrew the angels, pride. Dean Swift was an enemy of extravagance in dress, and particularly of that destructive ostentation in the middle classes, which led them to make an appearance above their condition in life. Of his mode of reproving this folly in those persons for whom he had an esteem, the following instance has been recorded. When George Faulkner, the printer, returned from London, where he had been soliciting subscriptions for his edition of the Dean's works, he went to pay his respects to him, dressed in a lace waistcoat, a big wig and other farperies. Swift received him with the same ceremonies as if he had been a stranger. And pray, sir, said he, what can be your commands with me? I thought it was my duty, sir, replied George, to wait on you immediately on my arrival from London. Pray, sir, who are you? George Faulkner, the printer, sir. You, George the printer. Why, you are the most impudent barefaced scoundrel of an imposter I have ever met. George Faulkner is a plain sober citizen, and would never trick himself out in lace and other farperies. Get you gone, you rascal, I will immediately send you to the house of correction. Away went George as fast as he could, and having changed his dress he returned to the deanery, where he was received with the greatest cordiality. My friend George, said the dean, I am glad to see you returned safe from London. Why, there has been an impudent fellow just with me dressed in lace waistcoat, and he would fain pass himself off for you, but I soon sent him away with a flea in his ear. Dress is certainly an index to the mind, it shows the spirit and internal quality of the soul, and there cannot be a more evident gross manifestation of a poor, degenerate breeding, than a rude, unpolished, disordered and slovenly outside, the boy that does not polish his shoes, comb his hair, brush his clothes, is in all probability morally affected, to consider such things matters of small hinges on which the doors of opportunity swing. Said a friend to a businessman on coming into the office, I should like to know on what ground you selected that boy, who had not a single recommendation. You are mistaken, said the gentleman, he had a great many. He wiped his feet when he came in and closed the door after him, showing that he was careful, he gave his seat instantly to that lame old man, showing that he was thoughtful, he took off his cap when he came in, and answered my questions promptly, showing that he was gentlemanly, 
He waited quietly for his turn, instead of pushing and crowding, showing that he was honorable and orderly. When I talked to him I noticed that his clothes were brushed, his hair in order, and when he wrote his name, I noticed that his fingernails were clean. Don't you call those things letters of recommendation? I do, and I would give more for what I can tell about a boy by using my eyes ten minutes than all the letters he can bring me. Be neat and clean in appearance, and not less so in habit. At home never throw your hat in one chair and your coat in another. Have a place for everything and put everything in its place. In school or at work let the same principle govern you, for what is worth doing is worth doing well. The boys now wanted are. Boys of neatness, boys of will. Boys of muscle, brain, and power. For to cope with anything. These are wanted every hour. Conduct is three-fourths of life. Matthew Arnold. Character makes the man, character and politeness mark the perfect man. The first is the diamond in the rough, the second the cut stone. The former may attract the attention of a few, the latter discloses hidden beauties and compels the admiration of all. The grand old name of gentleman can only belong to him who unites the qualities of gentleness and manliness, and politeness is essentially gentleness. The exercise of politeness benefits all, chiefly him who practices it, and this is a sure road to success. William of Wickham, Bishop of Winchester, and founder of Winchester and of New College, Oxford, was so convinced of the value of manners that he had the phrase manners make a man, inscribed in several places upon the walls of those structures. Good manners, said Emerson, are made up of petty sacrifices. Pleasant expression and action, pleasing exterior, and true kindness are gentle delights which win the esteem of others and often contribute to one's advancement more than real merit. Coarseness and gruffness, loose habits, and don care manners, never fail to lock doors and close hearts. You had better, wrote Chesterfield to his son, return a dropped fan genteelly, than give a thousand pounds awkwardly, better refuse a favor gracefully than grant it clumsily. All your Greek can never advance you from secretary to envoy, or from envoy to ambassador, but your address, your air, your manners, if good, may. These will give, as Emerson says, the mastery of palaces and fortunes wherever one goes without the trouble of earning or owning them. Cultivation of politeness is like putting the finishing touch upon the picture, it sets one off to the best advantage. Like a flower bed encircling the lawn, it beautifies character. Like a lamp in a dark room, it makes one's presence cheerful. Nothing has greater influence, and as Matthew Arnold said, it is three-fourths of life. As honey on the skin is a protection from the sting of the bee, so politeness will be a safeguard from the stings of the world. Doors will open at its knock. Sunbeams will sparkle in its presence, and everywhere, with everyone, it will act as a magic passport. Politeness has been defined in various ways, but all meet at the same point, like the spokes of a wheel which center in the hub. It is the art of showing, by external signs, the internal regard we have for others. It is, said Lord Chatham, benevolence in little things, as the giving others the preference in every enjoyment at the table, walking, sitting or standing. It is a willingness to please and to be pleased. It consists in treating others just as you love to be treated yourself. Henry IV, King of France, was once taken to task for returning the salute of a poor man as he was passing through a village. He replied, would you have your king exceeded in politeness by one of his meanest subjects? Because Nicholas I, Tsar of Russia, saw an officer of his household treat an old beggar woman discourteously, he summoned him to his imperial presence. 
The official was quite pleased. Nicholas soon undeceived him, and in the presence of a dozen courtiers, cut him to the quick with his indignant reproof. Enough, he said, finally, you will walk up and down that corridor all night, and every time you turn you will say, in a loud voice, I am a puppy. I am a puppy. I treat him as well as he treats me, said a boy to his mother. She had just reproved him because he did not attempt to amuse or entertain a boyfriend who had gone home. I often go in there and he doesn't notice me, said the boy. Do you enjoy that? asked the mother. Oh. I don't mind, I don't stay long, was the reply. I should call myself a very selfish person, remarked the mother, if friends came to see me and I should pay no more attention to them. Well, that's different, you're grown up, answered the son. Indeed, replied the mother, then you really think that politeness and courtesy are not needed among boys? The boy thus pressed, said he didn't mean exactly that. His father, having overheard the conversation, turned to him and said, a boy or a man who measures his treatment of others by their treatment of him, has no character of his own. He will never be kind or generous. If he is ever to be a gentleman, he will be so in spite of the boorishness of others. If he is to be noble, no other boy's meanness will change his nature. Remember this, my son, you lower yourself every time you are guilty of an unworthy action because someone else is. Be true to your best self, and no boy can drag you down, nor will he want to. Years ago, when Queen Victoria began her reign, the famous Lord John Russell was the minister in attendance upon Her Majesty at her Scottish home. There came late one evening a messenger, a little old man buried in a greatcoat, to the Aboyne Telegraph office, and delivered to the clerk a message from Lord John Russell to one of the officials of the government in London. The message did not bear a signature. On seeing this, the ill-mannered clerk flung it back to the old man, and said, put your name to it, it's a pity your master doesn't know how to send a telegram. The name was added and the message handed back. Why, you can't write either, cried the enraged clerk, after vainly trying to make out the signature, here, let me do it for you. What's your name? My name, said the little old man, very deliberately, is John Russell. Through his impoliteness that clerk lost his position. In some European countries, the word gentleman stands for a titled or wealthy man. When Sir Lawrence Almadedema was knighted a lady expressed herself to his lordship thus, Oh, dear Sir Lawrence, I am awfully glad to hear of the honor you have received, I suppose now that you have been knighted you'll give up painting pictures and live like a gentleman. Many are they who have this idea of gentlemanship. But in our land, the real gentleman stands for such personal qualities as honesty, truthfulness, gentleness, and gracefulness, which characterize a boy or man. Such a gentleman subjects his appetite, refines his taste, subdues his feelings, and controls his speech. When accidentally running against or passing before another, it will be, I beg your pardon. Please excuse me. When receiving a gift or extending a favor, it will be, I thank you. Some boys are not careful in their expressions. Sir, said Dr. Johnson, a man has no more right to say a rude thing to another than to knock him down. A young man once accosted Zachariah Fox, a Quaker, a rich merchant of Liverpool, with old chap, how do you make all your money? The Quaker replied, by dealing in an article that thou mayst deal in if thou wilt, civility. Monroe was so polite that he was called a gentleman of the old school. 
Henry Clay was said to make the most engaging bow of any gentleman of his day. Madison made it a point to touch his hat to everyone who bowed to him, and the front part of it was always worn threadbare in consequence of his lifting it. William Penn's formal but kindly politeness impressed even the Indians with whom he dealt, so that they named him the Good Big Chief. James Russell Lowell was as courteous to a beggar as to a lord, and was once observed holding a long conversation in Italian with an organ grinder whom he questioned about scenes in Italy with which both were familiar. You should not have returned their salute, said the master of ceremonies, when Clement XIV bowed to the ambassadors who had bowed in congratulating him on his election. Oh, I beg your pardon, replied Clement, I have not been Pope long enough to forget good manners. A number of years ago, a company of workmen was standing before a store in Oxford Street, London, looking at some pictures. The Honorable William E. Gladstone, who was then at the height of his popularity, halted a moment to look at the artist's work. One of the workmen recognized him and stepping up, said, Excuse me, Mr. Gladstone, but I should like to shake hands with you. Why, of course, I shall be glad to do so, the Premier of England responded, as he extended his hand not only to the man who had accosted him, but also to the little group of men who stood near, taking no notice of soiled hands or garments. Then he directed their attention to a fine engraving in the window, quietly pointing out not only its beauty, but some special feature in its execution that constituted its charm. Then raising his hat with a smile, he bade the men good morning, and passed on his way up the street. No wonder that in later years his fellow countrymen called him the grand old man, the people's William. He was a gentleman, exhibiting a lovely spirit of true friendship and absolute equality. What one is in the home is a fair criterion as to what he will be away from home. The manner in which a person conducts himself in the home determines largely his course and conduct in life. He who is polite and kind to his parents, considering their wishes, and heeding their advice and counsel, paves the way to future happiness and success. But he who spurns paternal suggestions, speaks and acts disrespectfully, is seldom respected and is always at a disadvantage. When Prince Bismarck was a boy, he was rebuked by his father for speaking of the king as Fritz. Learn to speak reverently of his majesty, said the old squire of Varzin, and you will grow accustomed to think of him with veneration. Bismarck laid the advice to heart and from that day profited by it. The truly polite boy is not only respectful to his parents, but also to his sisters and brothers, always returning a pleasant thank you for any kindness received at their hands, and showing as much courtesy to all at home as to those in the home of a neighbor. A beautiful form, says an American essayist, is better than a beautiful face, and a beautiful behavior is better than a beautiful form, it gives a higher pleasure than statues or pictures, it is the finest of the fine arts, it gives grace to one's bearing and enables one to look on the bright and beautiful side of things. Politeness is a universal debt that each boy owes to every person. The matter of caste, sex, position, and intelligence have nothing whatever to do with it. It should be the rule of conduct, wherever and in whatever society one may be, to practice politeness. Charles V was renowned for his courtesy. When he passed John Frederick, Elector of Saxony, he took off his hat and bowed to him, though his prisoner, 
who had been taken by him in battle. The poet Burns was one day walking in the street of Edinburgh when an honest farmer saluted him, which salute he returned when someone rebuked him. Mr. Burns replied that it was not the greatcoat, the scone bonnet, or the Saunders boot hose that he spoke to, but the man that was in them. Daniel Webster was once walking with a friend in Washington when a colored man passing by bowed very low to him. Mr. Webster promptly returned as deep in obeisance. Do you bow in that way to a darkie? asked his friend. Would you have me outdone in politeness by a Negro? replied the great statesman. Mr. Winans of Philadelphia became independently rich through his courteous manner. One day two strangers called on him. One was a foreigner who had visited some larger establishments in the city, but on their coming to Mr. Winans, a third or fourth-rate factory, he took so much pains to show all its parts and workings, and was so patient in his explanations and answers to their inquiries, that within a year, he was surprised by an invitation to transfer his labors to St. Petersburg and manufacture locomotives for the Tsar of Russia. He went, accumulated a large fortune, and ultimately received from his Russian workshops a hundred thousand dollars a year. Investing his money in real estate, he laid the foundation of one of the largest private fortunes in Philadelphia, and all this was the result of civility. It pays to cultivate politeness. To this day, the Japanese people revere the memory of General Grant. While visiting the emperor, he was invited to cross the imperial foot bridge near the palace at Tokyo, across which none but the blood royal had ever trod. General Grant accepted the invitation and walked beside the Mikado until they reached the center of the bridge. Then he stopped profoundly saluted the emperor, and said, Your Majesty, I have come so far to show you that I was not insensible to the honor you would do me, but I cannot violate your traditions. Let us return the way we came. Politeness serves one well. It is keener than sharpened steel. It is more magnetic than lodestone and worth more than jewels. At home or abroad, among young and aged, employers or teachers, inferiors or superiors, this glorious characteristic is a diadem from which sparkles a jewel, which is, as Chesterfield said, the treatment of others just as you love to be treated yourself. In the words of one greater than he, it is, do unto others as ye would they should do unto you. All other things being equal, the boy who adheres to these mottos is the one who succeeds. It makes him an acceptable companion, wins friendship and creates popularity. Give a poor boy fine manners and accomplishments, said Voltaire, and he will become the master of fortunes and palaces, while princes stand upon their threshold to solicit his friendship. Charles II is described by Macaulay as being the grandest rascal and most popular man in England. Hume, in giving the reason of this says, he was the best bred man alive.
What thou wilt. Thou must rather enforce it with thy smile. Then H-E-W to it with thy sword. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. In the strife of truth with falsehood, for the good or evil side. Lowell It is related of Cyrus, that when asked what was the first thing he learned, he replied, to tell the truth. Truthfulness is the foundation stone of character. Without it, a life, as it is developed, becomes more and more marred and falls short of its highest opportunity and calling. All qualifications that go to make up noble manhood count for naught, where there is not a persistent adherence to truthfulness. Therefore be true to yourself and the nobler impulses and yearnings of your heart by always speaking the truth, acting the truth, and living the truth. While a vessel was crossing the English Channel, a gentleman stood near the helmsman. It was a calm pleasant evening, and no one expected a storm. The flapping of a sail, as if the wind had suddenly shifted, caught the ear of the officer on watch, and springing to the wheel, he examined the compass. You are half a point off the course, he sharply said to the man at the wheel. The deviation was corrected and the officer returned to his post. It must be necessary to steer very accurately, said the observer, if half a point is of so much importance. Ah, remarked the officer, a half a point, sir, is liable to bring us directly on the rocks. What a lesson for every boy. The half a point deviation from strict truthfulness strands one on the rocks of falsehood. The shortest definition of a lie is the intention to deceive. It may not be telling an out-and-out falsehood to conceal a crime or to shield oneself, but telling it to mislead or deceive others. The essence of the thing, said Dewey, lies in the intention, and if the intention is to mislead, such, as Immanuel Kant says, is forfeiture of personal worth, a destruction of personal integrity. As he contends, a lie is the abandonment, or, as it were, the annihilation of the dignity of man. It will undermine the noble instincts of any boy and cause his character to collapse. A story of Abraham Lincoln shows his love for truth. It was a bright autumn evening when Abraham, a great awkward boy of 16 or 17, said to his mother, I'm going to the woods tomorrow. I've got a good job at Laird's, and as I shall be obliged to start by daybreak, I thought there might be some chores you wish to have done. You are a good boy, Abram, always thinking of helping me said his stepmother. If I was your own mother, you could not be more kind, and God will reward you sometime. Tomorrow, I am going to wash, and I would be very thankful if you would bring me a few buckets of water from the spring. Back and forth, the tall boy hurried, until all the tubs and kettles about the cabin were filled. Early next morning, When Abraham was ready to start for the place where the rails were to be split, his little sister Sally said, Can't I go, Abram? Just as mother says, replied he, pausing to give the little girl an opportunity to consult her mother. The mother would not consent. No sooner had Abram started than she determined to follow him 
and at once cut across the field, intending to reach the ravine before him and give him a genuine surprise by jumping out unannounced in the path as he came up. She carried out her plan successfully, and when she heard his merry whistle in the distance she climbed upon the bank to be ready to make the spring for his shoulders when the proper moment arrived. But the poor child had forgotten all about the sharp axe which he carried, and although she gained her coveted seat on his broad shoulders, her little bare foot received a gash from the cruel axe, which changed her merry laugh into a bitter cry. Why, Sally, how did you get here? was all the boy could say as he placed her tenderly on the bank and began an examination of the wounded foot. Finding it to be a deep cut, he gathered some broad plantain leaves which grew near, and by their aid soon succeeded in staunching the flow of blood. This accomplished, he tore the sleeve from his shirt and in his clumsy way bandaged the injured foot. Carrying her home, he learnt the story of her disobedience. She would have been willing to evade the truth in order to screen herself from her mother's displeasure, but honest, truthful Abraham would not permit this. Tell the truth, Sally, no matter what the consequences may be, he insisted, better suffer punishment than lie about it. I don't think mother will be hard on you when she sees how sorely punished you are, but never tell a lie to shield yourself, never. Such was the course taken through life by that boy, who later became the honored president of these United States. Much is said nowadays about degrees in lying. That is lying in a small way. There is the so-called white lie of custom when a certain article is slightly misrepresented to make a bargain, the white lie of courtesy when one makes politeness the garb behind which he deceives, the white lie of necessity when one would evade the truth by nodding the head, or giving a wrong impression. Some men, and even great men, have maintained that this is sometimes a necessity, but would it not be a fine moral precept to say, you must speak the truth generally, but you may utter a falsehood when it suits your convenience? Whoever licensed one thus? Justin Martyr said, is life at stake? We would not live by telling a lie. When Attilius Regulus was a prisoner of the Carthaginians, he was sent by that great people to Rome with several ambassadors to arrange for peace, on the understanding that if peace terms were not agreed upon he was to return to prison. He took the oath and swore to return. Arriving at Rome, he urged his countrymen to continue in war and not agree to the exchange of prisoners. This meant to him the return to Carthage. The senators and priests held that as his oath had been forced from him, he ought not to return. Then came the answer from Regulus which has made him imperishable, Have you resolved to dishonor me? I am not ignorant that death and tortures are preparing for me. But what are those to the shame of infamous action, or the wounds of a guilty mind? Slave as I am to Carthage, I have still the spirit of a Roman. I have sworn to return. It is my duty to return. Let the gods take care of the rest. One should never lie said Crispy, the great Italian statesman. I will not stain speech with a lie, said Pinder. 
The genuine lie is hated by all gods and men, said Plato. That man has no fair glory, said Theognis, in whose heart dwells a lie, and from whose mouth it has once issued. A lie is never justifiable, and to lie a little, is, as Victor Hugo remarked, not possible. The person who lies tells the whole lie, lying in the face of the fiend, and Satan has two names, Satan and lying. Therefore, let falsehood be a stranger to thy lips. Shame on the policy that first began. To tamper with the heart to hide its thoughts. And doubly shame on that inglorious tongue. That sold its honesty and told a lie. Nothing so corrupts early simplicity, quickly destroys the nobler instincts, and depraves the heart as falsehood. If a boy will lie about one thing, can he be trusted in anything? If he is branded as a liar, what teacher will respect him, what businessman will engage him, and what court will accept his testimony? I have seldom known anyone, said Paley, who deserted truth in trifles, who could be trusted in matters of importance. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, Sin has many tools, but a lie is the handle which fits them all. It destroys confidence, establishes false relations among men, blights the bloom of life, and saps the vital springs of existence. It is the progenitor of all wrongs, oppressions, cruelties, and crimes, and what boy is there who dare do it when God prohibits it? Like begets like, thus lies beget lies. Said Owen, one lie must be thatched over with another, or it will soon rain through. Lying brings misery. It troubles the conscience destroys the peace of mind and makes one suspicious of others. Because of this, Eugene Field, when a young man, walked 30 miles to confess to his employer and to ask forgiveness for an untruth he had told him. Lying brings punishment, for lying lips are an abomination unto the Lord. Because of this Elisha's servant was struck with leprosy, Ananias, and Sapphira with death, and many others have had the seal of God's wrath placed upon them. One day, as Archbishop Layton was going from Glasgow to Dunlane, a storm of lightning and thunder burst upon him. He was observed, when at a considerable distance, by two men of bad character. They had not the courage to rob him, but, wishing to extort money from him, one said, I will lie down by the wayside as if I were dead, and you shall inform the archbishop that I was killed by the lightning and beg money of him to bury me. When the archbishop arrived, the wicked wretch told the fabricated story. The archbishop sympathized with the pretended survivor, gave him money, and proceeded on his journey. But when the man returned to his companion, he found him really lifeless. Immediately he began to cry aloud, Oh, sir, he's dead. Oh, sir, he's dead. On this, the archbishop discovered the fraud and turning to the living man said, It is a dangerous thing to trifle with the judgment of God. How much better and safer to speak the truth, for... There is nothing so kingly as kindness, and nothing so royal as truth. Truthfulness is the foundation of character. It is the basis of true manhood. Its spirit pervades the closest relation and highest intercourse. Its law holds the planets in their course, and it is the presiding principle of every true and noble life. A greater tribute could not be paid to anyone than his word is as good as his bond. No more worthy epitaph or eloquent remark could be uttered of Colonel Hutterin 
than when a friend, attesting the simplicity and nobility of him, said, He never professed the thing he intended not. No eulogy can surpass Sinocrates of Petrarch, who, standing before an ecclesiastical tribunal where an oath had been required of others, said, As for you, Petrarch, your word is sufficient. An important conference was being held in the executive mansion in Washington. A caller had sent in his card, but either the caller was unwelcome or the time was quite unsuitable for his admission. One of the persons turned to a servant and said, Tell the person who sent up the card that the president is not in. No, said General Grant, tell him no such thing. Then, turning to his friends, he remarked, I don't lie myself, and I don't want any of my servants to lie for me. A mental photograph book was once presented to Charles Kingsley in which to write. One question was, what is your bet in war? A lie, he penned. In dedicating her delightful biography of him, his wife wrote. To the beloved memory of a righteous man who loved God and truth above all things, a man of untarnished honor, loyal and chivalrous, gentle and strong, Modest and humble, tender and true. Pitiful to the weak, yearning after the erring. Stern to all forms of wrong and oppression. Yet most stern toward himself. Who being angry yet sinned not. Truthfulness underlies all honest and faithful work, all social confidence, all right fulfillment of relations and self-respect. It regulates lives and improves and elevates those it characterizes. It is one great secret of success in business, a magnet that draws confidence and wields a power second to none in the universe. A poor Persian boy was about to leave his mother's home, to engage in business in the city. Within the lining of his coat, she sewed forty golden dinars, which she had saved during years of labor. Before the boy started, she cautioned him to beware of robbers as he went across the desert, and as he left the home, she said, Fear God, and never tell a lie. The boy started, and toward evening saw in the distance the glittering minarets of the great city, but between the city and himself he saw a cloud of dust. It came nearer. Presently he saw that it was caused by a band of robbers. One of them approached him and unceremoniously inquired what valuables he had. The boy answered with candor, Forty golden dinars are sewed up in my garments. Discrediting the boy's story, he wheeled his horse around and rode back to his companions. Soon another robber came and said, Boy, what have you got? Forty dinars sewed in my garments, he answered. The robber laughed and rode away. At last the chief came and asked him what he had. The boy replied, I have already told two of your men that I have forty dinars sewed up in my clothes. The chief ordered his clothes torn open, and the money was found. He was then asked what induced him to make such a revelation. Because, said the boy, I would not be false to my mother, whom I solemnly promised never to tell a lie. The robber leaned upon his spear and after reflecting said, Wait a moment. 
He mounted his horse and rode back to his comrades, but soon returned dressed as a merchant. Boy, said he, art thou so mindful of thy mother, while I am insensible at my age of that duty I owe God? Give me thy hand, that I may swear repentance on it. He did so, and his followers were struck with the scene. Said he, I am a merchant. I have a large business house in the city. I want you to come and live with me to teach me about your God, and you will be rich, and your mother some day shall come and live with us. Then one of the robbers turned to the chief and said, You have been our leader in guilt, be the same in the path of virtue. And taking the boy's hand, they all promised to lead new lives. Boys, speak only that which is true. You may do much good by it, although you may never lead a band of robbers to God and honesty. But... Nothing good shall ever perish. Only the corrupt shall die. Truth, which men and angels cherish, flourishes eternally. Good old Matthew Henry used to say, Truth is mighty and will prevail. Falsehood, as one of the kings of Prussia said, sometimes does good for twenty-four hours, but like a battle well fought, right comes off more than conqueror. Falsehood is always defeated. It shrinks at detection and in due time is compelled to confess. Truth is sure and has a firm foundation because it is an attribute of God. And God and truth, said Theodore Parker, are always on the same side. Therefore, seize upon truth, where'er tis found, amongst your friends, amongst your foes, on Christian or on heathen ground, the flowers divine where'er it grows. Maintain your rank, vulgarity despise. To swear is neither brave, polite, nor wise. You would not swear upon a bed of death. Reflect, your maker now may stop your breath. One moonlight night I was passing near a sentinel's post. It was during the winter of 1861-2, in front of Alexandria, Virginia, at Camp California. The sentinel, in some trouble, used rough, coarse language, closing with an oath. Approaching him, till I could see his face, think of my astonishment to find him, instead of a burly man of low life, a handsome boy of seventeen. I said to him pleasantly, how could your mother have taught you to swear? Dropping his head with a sudden shame, he answered, she didn't, general. I learned it here. And indeed, it came from the influence of his associates. One's language always gauges him. Few things are more important and far-reaching than the use of words. If good, they have power to sewage. The tumults of a troubled mind and are as balm to festered wounds. If bad, they corrupt and may flourish as Carlyle said, like a hemlock forest after a thousand years. Immodest words admit of no defense, for want of decency is want of sense. One of the most historic structures in the world was the Campanile, or the bell tower of St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. Not long since it fell, one aged Lugue Vendrasco knew its danger. For ten years, he had not ceased to beg the government to allow him to put the Campanile in better order. But his warnings were unheeded. One Sunday morning, he took his son to see it. 
As the young man looked upon the crack he said, that's nothing. A small crack like that can really do no harm to such a building. Replying, the father said, son, it is not the crack. It is that of which the crack is the effect and symbol. Our campanile is doomed. The next morning it fell with an awful crash. In like manner many a man has come tumbling down. His character was not safe because of some flaw in it. Improper words prove its great defect as the crack did the weakness of the campanile. Stephen Price, once mayor of New York and a warm friend to boys, lost his life in a steamboat disaster. When his body was recovered, a scrap of paper was found in his pocketbook. It was so worn with oft reading that the words were scarcely legible, but two paragraphs were finally made out, one of which was, good company and good conversation are the very sinews of virtue. In fact, these are inseparable. Conversation is a reflex of character, and no boy can associate with another who delights in slangy, smutty talk without being more or less contaminated. A very common and bad habit of some boys is the attachment of improper words to a sentence, as if it made it more binding. These in no sense give grace or beauty to language. They do not round out a period or enrich a metaphor. They define nothing, bound nothing, measure nothing, mean nothing, accomplish nothing, and he who uses them should be shunned. Vulgar expressions are never in order. They help, as South says, no one's education or manners. They are disgusting to the refined, abominable to the good, insulting to those with whom one associates, degrading to the mind, and profitable, needless and injurious to society, and beneath the dignity of any self-respecting person. Are there any ladies around? said a young officer to a group of others, I have a splendid story to tell. There are no ladies present, said General Ulysses S. Grant, who overheard the remark, but there are gentlemen here, sir, and what is not fit for a lady to hear is unfit for a gentleman. When Coleridge Patterson, the martyred bishop of Melanesia, was a boy at Eton, he was enthusiastically fond of cricket, at which he was an unusually good player. At the cricket suppers at Eton, it was the custom to give toasts followed by songs, and these songs were often of a very questionable sort. Before one of these suppers, Coley told the captain that he would protest against the introduction of anything that was vulgar or indecent. His protest apparently had no effect. For during the evening, one of the boys arose and began to sing a song which Coley thought was not fit for decent boys to hear. Whereupon, rising from his seat, he said, If this sort of thing continues, I shall leave the room. It was continued, and he left. The next day he wrote to the captain of the Eleven, saying unless he received an apology, he should withdraw from the club. The apology was sent and Patterson remained. By that stand he showed his character, which won the admiration of the rest and brought about a new state of affairs. No boy need answer another who addresses him in unbecoming language. He might say as Stephen A. Douglas, when denounced in the Senate in improper language, what no gentleman should say, no gentleman need answer. And as to keeping the company of anyone who is inclined to be vulgar, there is no law to compel it. Far better be a Coleridge Patterson in shunning such company. The true gentlemanly boy has a sense of honor, scrupulously avoiding profane words as he would profane actions. No habit is more unbecoming, useless, and contagious than swearing. 
It is the fool's impulse and the coward's fortification. It neither helps one's manners nor education, and no boy with the least personal pride will be guilty of indulging in it. Louis IX of France punished everyone who was convicted of swearing by searing his lips with a hot iron. George Washington made the following law August 3, 1776, which he caused to be read to the men under his command, the general is sorry to be informed that the foolish and wicked practice of profane cursing and swearing, a vice heretofore little known in an American army, is growing into fashion, he hopes the officers will, by example as well as influence, endeavor to check it, and that both they and the men will reflect that we can have but little hope of the blessing of heaven on our armies. If we insult him by our impiety and folly, added to this, it is a vice so mean and low, without any temptation, that every man of sense and character detests and despises it. Years ago, the Honorable John Finch visited an asylum in the East and asked to see a certain professional gentleman committed there. He had been a good and true man, but by overwork, physical and mental, had wrecked himself and become a raving maniac. The superintendent of the asylum said, You will not want to see him again, he swears so. As they entered the room in which the man was locked in a straight jacket, the most vulgar oaths came from his lips. Touching the superintendent, Mr. Finch said, what can this mean? When I knew that man, he was one of the grandest Christians, true, noble, and good in every respect, and now to hear such vile language coming from him surprises me. The superintendent said, he learned to swear when a boy. The impressions made on his brain at that period of life when the brain most readily receives impressions now become the governing ones. In this asylum, we can almost uniformly tell what have been the habits, customs, and abuses of insane people when they were children. The brain at such times receives impressions readily. The impressions are permanent, and if they have indulged in vile practices, or used bad language, the dethronement of reason and intelligent conscience will give to early impressions and habits the control of the mind. This being true, how careful every boy should be, for who wants the bad habits of youth noticeable in age? There are many ways in which language may be improperly used but none more unbecoming and attended with more serious consequences than blasphemy, or using the name of God or Christ with disrespect. It is a presumptuous sin against which God has declared, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, declaring with emphasis, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Sometimes, as Jacob Knapp said in his autobiography, God steps aside from his ordinary course and smites presumptuous sinners dead, that they may stand as beacon lights to warn others to shun the rocks on which they struck. During the Black Hawk War, in Illinois, at the time when God sent the cholera among the people, an officer cursed God for sending the disease into their midst. With an awful oath, he opened his mouth, and God smote him down even as the word trembled on his lips. Such cases are rare, yet the words, will not hold him guiltless, show that he forgets not, and that sometime he will hold the blasphemer accountable. Howard, the philanthropist, on hearing anyone use blasphemous expressions, always buttoned up his coat. Being asked the reason, he replied, I always do this when I hear men swear.
as I think that anyone who can take God's name in vain can also steal. Nothing so chills one's blood as to hear the blessed supreme rudely appealed to on each trifling theme. Therefore maintain your rank, vulgarity despise. To blaspheme is neither brave, polite, nor wise. You would not do so upon the bed of death. Reflect. Your maker now could stop your breath. Many years ago when the Duke of Gordon was spending the day in a Scotch village, a company of soldiers was drawn up under the window of the room in which the Duke and a party of friends were enjoying themselves. The officer in command was inspecting his men's arms and clothes, and if anything displeased him he berated the soldier with blasphemous oaths. The Duke, who abhorred such language, expressed a wish that the inspection might soon be over. If your grace desires it, said one of the company, I will clear the coast of this man of oaths without noise or bloodshed. Do so, and I'll be obliged to you, said the duke. The gentleman stepped into the street, took his station behind the officer, and pulled off his hat. As the officer swore, the gentleman, with the great solemnity of a parish clerk, said in a loud voice, Amen. What do you mean? asked the officer, hastily turning around. I am joining with you in prayer, answered the gentleman with a grave face. I thank you, sir, rejoined the officer, but I have no further need for a clerk. Soldiers! To the right about, march! and he and his soldiers departed, much to the amusement and happiness of the duke, after teaching an important lesson to the officer that it is wrong to call upon God to do this or that, or to belittle others by vile epithets, which never fail to bring in due time just retribution. My boy, the only language to use is the pure and refined. By words, slang phrases, Profanity and blasphemy are only uttered by lips whose heart is bad, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Let your tongue utter sound sentences, choice words and pleasant expressions, then will they be musical to the ears of the good, sweet to the soul of the pious, educational to those who associate with you, and beneficial to all. From this day, put into practice the last words of the eloquent John B. Goff. He was lecturing in the Presbyterian Church, Frankfurt, PA, on the night of February 19, 1886. In the course of that lecture he said, I have seven years in the record of my own life when I was held in the iron grasp of intemperance. I would give the world to blot it out, but alas, I cannot. Then, stepping forward, with an impressive gesture, he added, Young man, keep your record, but he was unable to finish the sentence, for he sank insensible into a chair from which he was never able to rise. Evidently he meant to say, Young man, keep your record clean. Do not forget that improper words have a reflex influence. A fable is told how a bee took an offering of honey to Jupiter, which so pleased him that he promised to grant the bee whatever it should ask. The bee said, O glorious Jove, give thy servant a sting, that when anyone approaches my hive to take the honey, I may kill him on the spot. Jupiter answered, Your prayer shall not be granted in the way you wish, but the sting you ask for, you shall have, and when anyone comes to take away your honey, and you sting him, the wound shall be fatal, not to him, but to you, for your life shall go with the sting. Psalm 
So is it to this day. He that curseth others, curseth himself. Therefore, my boy, control your tongue, and keep the door of your lips, remembering. Tis reason's part. To govern and to guard the heart. To lull the wayward soul to rest. Reason may calm this doubtful strife. And steer thy bark through various life.